Uh, okay. Morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Siavash, and uh, I'm happy to be with you for uh, the next 90 minutes. And uh, we go over some gene expression analysis in R. So uh, I guess we are like 51 people, so we can start. So, uh, so the the logistic here is like you can unmute yourself, or you can turn your camera on. It's up to you. But if you want to unmute yourself and ask question, because this is an interactive workshop, so um, it's better first raise your hand like with with any sign here, and then. Uh, uh, I let you, uh, so you can then go ahead and ask your question, but any time in between, if you have any question, you can raise your hand and ask question. There is no uh, question period at the end. It's interactive. You can ask your question in between. So just, just please uh, raise your hand and then you can unmute yourself. Uh, so we can start. Uh, So, uh, so the pipeline, uh, the general pipeline for for uh, RNA bulk RNA sequence uh, analysis in R is like usually we first get the raw data and then uh, from the fast A file and then quality control make it fast Q and then do alignments uh, to make a SAM or binary version of it, which is called BAM file, and then align reads to genes and uh, create a count matrix. Uh, so the, the, the first four steps are uh, time consuming and it's beyond the scope of this workshop. So, uh, and you can see the other tutorial that we put in the GitHub the link uh, using star. Uh, but what we are focusing for this workshop is uh, differential expression uh, using R and we use the DSEQ library for that. So we already uh, process the file, uh, the fast, uh, fast A file and process it, make it BAM file, align it and create a count matrix. We just load the count matrix. Uh, so uh, the experiment design uh, and data that we used uh, are kind of uh... so I I answered the question yeah yeah slides slides gonna be uh, available afterwards I'm gonna put it thank you thank you for your question so uh, experimental design uh, uh, like that we use the database that we use for this analysis. There are five different five different patients, uh, which are at very high level, advanced stage of uh, prostate cancer. So uh, we we like I guess they took the the biopsy sample uh, from the tumor cell uh, in two different condition. So uh, treat them first in a control condition with DMSO and treated with a drug like which is called SP2109 and then do RNA seq for each of them so then five uh, patients five patients treated with uh, uh, control and drug so this is this is the experimental design so i hope that you guys uh, Install the libraries in R, and uh, let me know if you have any help. Yeah, the, the these these slides I'm gonna put it in the in the workshop I guess link or or, or I send I email to you guys anyways these these slides, 
So that that is yeah, that's true. That's only one slide. So we're gonna add it. So uh, everything's uh, so the files and everything's on GitHub, and so uh, so you can you can uh, use terminal and clone it here, and like create a directory for yourself and clone it. Uh, so uh, like create a directory anywhere like on your desktop, just go to your directory and uh, make sure uh, that you are on a git, uh, on a correct, like make sure you click git branch and you are on the correct git uh, branch. So, uh, and there are some libraries that we, we put instruction uh, for installation. So, uh, let me see the questions. So uh, I, I hope that you guys inst already installed because there is no time now for installation. And we assume that you, uh, inst you clone it from GitHub. And also we, we put the instruction uh, uh, here for uh, for each uh, library how to install it like some of them from cran some of them from bioconductor and some of them from github and uh, so uh i hope you guys did it before if not just watch this tutorial and this is recorded you can go and do it yourself but that's that's pretty easy and straightforward so just clone it in a, a directory for yourself and everything's there and uh, then uh, uh install all the package needed based on based on the instruction there so and uh, so we we assume that you did that we we take from here we just load all the libraries needed uh, so there are some from cran some from bioconductor some from github so the next step you can just uh, set the your working directory to the directory that you are in you can just uh, get it uh, you can just uh, use a set wd or go to your session set working directory and choose your directory from here so either way is uh, working so then make you can make sure if you are you want to make sure you are in a correct directory you can check it with get wd that you are in a correct uh, directory so because i already did that i don't need to set it for myself uh, but I, I do it again Sorry. And then uh, we need to create uh, some folders for output. So we create one, one uh, output and then uh, another directory in the output, as you can see here for figures that we already did that and, and it's on the GitHub that we save all the figures uh, as PDF. So about the how to clone the repo, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, I can show you just because you asked. So if you go there uh, to your GitHub, so you click on code on HTTPS, you can get the link and just copy that and come back to your terminal, to your terminal just make sure you are in a correct folder just just go to your correct folder and then use git clone and then copy paste the 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 what what you copied here i didn't copy what you copied here from clipboard you can copy here so then you create the uh, you it's it's pretty straightforward just git clone and you get the link from here but yeah, I assume that you already did that. So we get back to the question, we, to, to the rest of it. So 
we load the director. We, we... Yeah, Brian, you can uh, unmute yourself and ask question. Uh, you're not on mute. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, uh, uh, Savage. Uh, 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 many of us who work with this kinds of data, we try to keep a uh, local repository up to date. Just wondering if you can walk us through how to do that. You just showed us how to clone uh, your repo, but how do we, if you make changes in your uh, GitHub repository, how do we uh, keep a local version of the repository up to date? So after, after you make changes on your local, you can just, uh, there are some, uh, so git add dot and then git commit and git push. You uh, just send all, all your changes again back to, to the remote. Make sure first first set your uh, uh, the, the, the remote uh, repository. And uh, I guess you need to go to your GitHub and ask uh, because you cannot push to our, our GitHub. So you can just pull it from our GitHub, but later if you wanna push, you, you, you have to set another remote repository for yourself and push it to that one. So this one is uh, the current, uh, you, can, you can ask your question, yeah. Yes, so if you updated your repository and we wanted to keep track of any changes in your repository, how do yeah. we? that what's that command yeah that's that's what i'm saying you cannot push into our repository but you can create another repository for yourself on your github for example and then you can go for example here and you can see the history of uh, any commits happening you can see uh, that's that's you can keep track of the the changes that happen after you git add, git commit, and git push, you can keep track of it. But that's, I guess, beyond the scope of this course. We can we can chat offline if you. So uh, yeah, so get back again to to the main point. So we get the the directories, and then uh, the next step is getting the input data and getting the input data, uh, just we put it in the data folder already. So you can uh, load them by these lines. And uh, so the next step, we wanna look into what we load, just we view them. So there are two things. I described the experimental design. I described the five different patients that we have and treated like once with DMSO control, once with the drug. So two things are necessary uh, for analysis. Uh, and we put it in the data uh, folder. Uh, the first one is read count table. And the second one is sample info. No, after after I view it, I just I can go through each of them and explain what is mean. So each count matrix usually has uh, different rows, and the rows are genes, and columns are different conditions. So rows, genes, and columns are different condition. In sample info, uh, we get the same sample in rows like the columns of read counts 
going to be rows of our sample info. As you can see, for example, we have DMSO number one, number two, number three, number five, and uh, two like SP and different one. So uh, for sample info, uh, we have DMSO number one to, to five and SP one to five. We have another column called condition, which is either DMSO or SP 2509 treated and replicate, which means the, the biological replicates that we have now uh, number one to five. A mutation count, uh, it came from whole genome uh, sequencing analysis, the total mu mutation count in each sample and diagnosis age is the age that the patient diagnosed and uh, this is PSA prostate uh, uh, antigen uh, level and the stage of the cancer, uh, which uh, the good thing is all of them at the same stage, all five different patients at the very uh, high level. But for our analysis, it's a good thing that they are at all at the same stage. And uh, so we don't have variability in different stages. And uh, we have a uh, mutation burden. Uh, so uh, here uh, that uh, uh, that is another uh, factor that might be important. So going to question. Yeah, it's question about still about the Git. So yeah, you can you can just for uh, our analysis, you can just clone it, but you cannot push it back to our repository because you don't have the credential. But you can make a remote repository for yourself on your GitHub, and just as people mentioned, like the set origin master, and then. Uh, Uh, the question is, is it going to affect? Uh, uh, yeah, if uh, so, the thing is, if they are at a different stage, we have a different factor of variability. No, we have five different uh, biological replicates. For example, at different, like imagine, like if they are at a different stage. So um, I go through the data to plots, and you can understand better later because uh, that's adding another factor of variability and makes the data uh, harder to interpret. So here's the data that we load. So uh, the next step that we wanna do, first we wanna do a little bit of pre-processing. So we wanna make sure that, uh, for example, our uh, the, the read count matrix, we wanna uh, put this uh, gene ID column as a row name. Uh, so to, to make it cleaner, uh, so and then get rid of that column. So if we run this, and uh, so you can see the read count here. So we put that uh, the ensemble ID. We put the ensemble ID as a row name, make it clear for our further analysis. So the next step that we're gonna do, we wanna increment all the reads by one. So, cause zero read counts can make error in our further analysis. And because this is differential expression, that's okay. Because we, add, we increment all the genes and all the counts uh, by one, all different condition by one. So we do that and you can view again See, for example, this, this used to be zero, but no, it's one. Uh, so uh, that's another thing. So uh, we're gonna do the same thing for sample info. The sample info, the, the row name, we're gonna put the sample column as a row name. So uh, we do that and view it again. Just if you see the sample info, you can see we put it as a row name. So there is one question. No, no, no more question. Okay. So uh, 
before before we start our basic analysis so we have some checks that should be done uh, otherwise uh, we can uh, see problem afterwards and that's waste of time so we want to make sure as i mentioned like the sample info rows are the same as uh, read cons columns so we want to make sure first that all the row names of sample info are in the columns of read count and are equal and if we make a temporary count matrix from row names with the sample info the, 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 so we we make another matrix temporary from our read count matrix with the row names of row with the row names of row names of sample info and that should be equal to uh again to call names of our uh, the call names of that matrix should be equal to row names of our sample info so these three checks uh, we do and all should be tr uh, true uh, and see if we see the true that means we are good so data loaded correctly Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Yeah, we, we can do it, but yeah, it's in sample info. But I didn't. Yeah, but yeah, that's that's a good point. We can we can get rid of also, uh, this sample, but because uh, it's no harm, so I guess I I leave it there. Uh, okay, so uh, now we wanna start our D seek analysis and creating a DSIC object. Uh, so uh, just just a little bit because it's there is no time for that, but uh, just just briefly, I'm gonna explain uh, uh, I'm gonna explain how it works like DSIC. Uh, so there is a paper uh, came in 2010 about DSIC and if you are interested, you want to know more, you can go read the paper. Uh, but the thing is the first people uh, thought, so based on the re based on our read counts and uh, they try to fit, uh, they try to predict kind of variation uh, among our biological replicates from our mean of uh, read counts. And uh, they first, they thought the Poisson distribution is the best uh, to describe it. Uh, but Poisson, as you know, uh, Poisson only has uh, one uh, parameter. Uh, standard deviation is equal to mean in Poisson, and that should be linear. So uh, then, and, not, uh, and doesn't fit with the real world data. So another method came out, HR, which is a dash line. And uh, then, then DC came. DC uh, looks like that's the best fit and the best prediction of uh, uh, our uh, read count, uh, our variation read count based on mean. So uh, what DSIC, that's, that's, that's the, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go through the math, but just, just suffice to say that instead of Poisson, it uses a negative binomial. And uh, in negative binomial, we have a mean and we have a dispersion here. Dispersion is proportional to variation, but we call it dispersion here. And the dispersion is uh, uh, actually mean and dispersion are uh, correlated to size factor. And what DSIC does usually first estimate the size factor and then try to estimate dispersions based on our as I mentioned, based, based on the mean cons, try to uh, uh, predict the variation, the dispersion using the, the ma maximum likelihood estimation and then fit a linear model. And then afterwards we do the hypothesis testing to see if the uh, differential expression is significant or not. So the, the limitation that we have in our data because usually we have few number of replicates like in our case for example we have five so uh, that makes it unreliable so uh, dsic 
try to solve this problem by sharing information across the genes actually uh, assumes that some genes with the similar expression level for example here if you look some genes with the similar expression le level they assume the dispersion level is also the same that's the main assumption in the seq uh, model uh, that we use so that's a, that's a brief uh, intro, but getting back to R and uh, see how uh, we can uh, implement it in R. So uh, we want to first create a DC2 object, but uh, uh, to, uh, for, for better, uh, I, I guess for easier uh, interpretation of results and data in, in future analysis that we can see, so we, we're going to name uh, the DMSO as a control factor and uh, SP2509 as a treatment factor. So just just uh, just different name. So the first function uh, that is important in DSIC2 is to create a, a DSIC data set. So uh, the, the function called DSIC data set from matrix and we have to uh, pass through this function three different things. So first count data. So count data is our read count matrix that we read it here. Read counts here. And uh, that's our count data. Call data is our sample info, another file that we loaded. So, and another thing is our design uh, factor. So for example, now, if you go to sample info, there is a column called condition. We wanna say, okay, we wanna design our experiment based on this column. We wanna just compare two different things if it's DMSO or drug treated. So that's why here we just tilt and then condition. So. Imagine we have another column, like, like I mentioned, like, and someone asked if it's uh, the stage is different. So imagine we want to take into account that stage. So you can, it's, the, it, we don't have time for that for this session, but you guys can do it if you have any uh, similar experiment for yourself with the plus sign, you can add any other uh, columns that you have, you can add it here and make it multivariate. So just, but to make it simple, our analysis here for this workshop, we only assume condition, but yeah, we can, if the stage are different, you can using plus sign and adding a stage uh, also into, into the column. Yeah, it depends, depends on your experimental design and depends on what you're looking for. So um, you are looking for, to, you wanna study something. And for example, this case is very simple. We wanna see if the condition of drug or uh, the untreated, how they are different. But imagine some case, uh, so we have drug, we have other types of condition, as you mentioned, like batch or, uh, we have some technical replicates sometimes, and and you want to see uh, if it's uh, the how contamination in your lab uh, can affect the data. So depends on what you are looking for. So you can just adding to your design, but we keep it simple. Just uh, use the condition here. Uh, we create this uh, data set from matrix, the, uh, the, uh, now we create the DDS object so we can view it. As you can see here, there are different slots and uh, might be confusing, but uh, that's fine because we can go through each of them and see what does it mean. So design is like the design that, for example, you can see here is uh, only condition. Uh, dispersion function, 
as I mentioned, it's a dispersion, try to fit the dispersion based on means and the uh, raw range and call data assays. We only have one assay here, but imagine we have multiple assays uh, in our experiment. So we might have different assays, uh, but now for this experiment is only one assay that we use. Sometimes like th there are uh, multiple assays. So if you click on the call data and go to list data, so you can see the sample, the condition, the replicate, mutation count, and diagnosis age, PSA, the, the, the state, the, the, those columns that are in sample info. So then you can um, then go to call data and the list data and see them. But uh, uh, we can we can access them in another way that I show you in a few lines uh, later. So uh, because we only as I, as I mentioned, we have only one assay. Just just we can adding if if we have different assay, it's it adding different assay. But just I want to show you it's the same thing, and uh, you can get the counts uh, counts of uh, that DDS object using the count function or using a says uh, dollar sign counts. So, and as you can see, they are uh, similar. They are the same uh, object the, that created here. So just, just wanted to show that they are uh, the same. So either way you can um, access to your counts data. So uh, I showed you that we have multiple columns here that you can go through it like you can with call data, list data, but there are easier way that you can access them. PCA, for example, replicates and condition. You can just DDS and dollar sign and access them as, as, and as you can see, uh, different uh, conditions are here, like DMSO, 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 SP, and uh, five different replicates and uh, uh, for PSA as well. So um, another step that we want to do, uh, because we assume like some uh, low read counts can be noise, can be contamination. And uh, so we, we want to kind of narrow down our analysis just to save time. And uh, we here, we set a threshold of at least 10 reads. You can go like further. It's up to you. You can go, for example, 20 or any other minimum that you want. We set this threshold just because we want to make sure any, any genes uh, that has higher counts uh, come to our uh, final matrix. We're just uh, defining a variable keep and in uh, our DDS. Uh, object just uh, try to keep uh, the only the, the, the ones that we want for example here you can uh, uh, just we can view it like different uh, in in the, in the counts with the count if you uh, see now uh, they are lower So uh, uh, the next step that we want to reorder the condition level, for example, we want to set DMSO as a control. So uh, using relevel function, which is in the uh, DSIC2 library and uh, working on DDS object. So you can uh, change your condition and, and uh, set a reference. We wanna set uh, the reference to be DMSO. We wanna set our control to be DMSO. Be, you, you, you have to set one of them to be control and one of them to be wild type. So we set the control factor as our reference. And as I mentioned here, we uh, define control factor as a variable, which is DMSO. So we created to uh, make lives easier here. So uh, 
now the, the main after this re-leveling re and after creating the data set from matrix that's the main uh, we need to run the main function in the ESIC library which is called the ESIC on DDS object that we have we just run it and as you see estimating size factor as I mentioned estimate size like that's what uh, what the ESIC2 works estimating size factor dispersion and then try to fit a model and uh, now the ESIC2 fitted and we can uh, view it again as you can see here is uh, the DDS object that we have with 30, uh, 4,000 uh, different genes uh, and different columns that we can see. So um, the threshold actually it's it's up to you you can sometimes you need to play around with it sometimes uh, you don't have time uh, for your uh, analysis you and you want to make sure you only get the top ones so you can set it higher um, but usually even even you uh, it's it's not necessary to to have a threshold for example you can you can go for all the genes but to keep it cleaner simple and save time that's what we usually do but like sometimes you you're looking for top 20 genes and you know anything under 100 for example is like you don't care about them so it depends on uh, what you look for so after we we done with the dseq and created the dds object uh, now we want to check the dd uh, the, the dseq analysis uh by visualizing it uh, so first thing is uh, because we want to make sure everything's correct and uh, our experiment because sometimes you you get the data from lab and you want to see if if there is a huge contamination in it or not so if you want to analyze further or you want to just do the check and say oh no this time the 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 the, the experiment looks like didn't work so we, we you're gonna try different ways so we can uh, do some uh, easy ways like plotting so one of them is dispersion estimate plot so if you plot this dispersion uh, estimate so here's the plot that you can see uh, So uh, as I mentioned, uh, this is the mean of normalized count and this is dispersion. So these seek try to fit dispersion based on the mean of normalized count. So, and this is the fitted line and these are the real data. And uh, as I mentioned, there is an assumption uh, in these seek some of the genes with the similar expression level, they share the, a dispersion also uh, so then it tries to uh, kind of uh, avoiding some noise and outliers this is the final uh, fit line and this looks good so this is the line that you should be looking for and um, because that makes sense anything that has higher counts dispersion is lower in, and anything the the counts is uh, uh, lower uh, the variability is higher so that's uh, the type of line that you should be looking for so these are for example these are high count gene like housekeeping genes that are usually here because there are high counts and the variability is lower but like some like transcription factors some some genes that are not express that high uh, are in this part of the uh, the plot so this is the plot that everything looks okay so uh, the next thing that you want to do is using results function and getting this dds object you get the results of uh, 
basic analysis and put it in res variable. So in order to view it better, I created data frame uh, uh, from my res variable. Then we can uh, view the data frame. As you can see here, so this is uh, ensemble IDs as a row name uh, for genes. And you see base means and log two fold change. You can see for each gene, like in different condition in control and drug treated, how the log two fold change, uh, how, how it changed um, lo logarithmically. And uh, you can see different columns, the stats, P value, uh, as I mentioned, the D6 also after uh, calculating the log to full change, doing some hypothesis testing to see if the, the, the change is significant or not and create a P value and the Q value or P adjusted value based on P value. And uh, so, because we have uh, multiple comparison analysis here, we have a lot of genes here. So we need to take into account the P adjusted or Q value. And I assume these seek to using Benjamin e. Hochberg uh, multiple comparison uh, for P adjusted. But we care about P adjusted value because there are 30,000, 40,000 of genes and we have, if we have 5% of false discovery rate, that, that will be a lot. So with using P-adjusted, we um, make it more stringent uh, for our analysis. Okay, so going to question, P adjust, some P adjust are NAs. Uh, so that's, that's, that's a good question. Probably, uh, I'm not, I'm not sure how to answer this. Uh, probably I, I should go offline and check it afterwards and we can be in touch over email. Uh, I'm not sure. The plot data, uh... Where did the plot data? Plot data is use the DDS, just, just put DDS object because this function is in D6 to library and you just, you, you have to just pass the DDS, not DDS element metadata. The model is different data. Yeah, it's we can we can compare uh, actually the the limo woman the D six uh, and we can we can have the comparison. It's it's not that hard. Just just I have to just just few lines of code and we can do the comparison. Uh, but I haven't done it here. But that's it. That's it. That's a good idea. We can go over it. Uh, Question, is there a way to determine which li library data frame and method call is coming from, for instance? So all the, all the libraries, uh, all, the li all the function that I mentioned here, so the, the main function data, a DSeq data set from matrix, uh, count uh, DSeq relevel, uh, plot this, this these are these are coming from the seek to library in R. These are built in uh, function 
and also results that you can just pass the DDS, the DSIC object, and it recognizes it as a DSIC object. And uh, yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Some of them, 2000 of them in the, the, the NA one. Yeah, I, I, I have to. Uh, so some person, thank you for the for the link for explanation. Uh, so the result. What do you mean to go to the help and look for a result from package you uploaded? The results function. Results method. The results is not in the help. It's in, uh, you need to go through the DSIC2 documentation. Uh, yes, you can, you can un unmute. Remo? Um, hi, thank you. Um, why did my, um, first, thank you so much for answering the question. Um, why did the uh, data frame, when I call the DDS at element metadata, it has zero columns. I mean, yours didn't have zero columns. So why did you use element? Uh, so, uh, for which function you mean, which, which function, results function? So this was um, one the, one of the calls that we had. Let's see, when you're calling DDS. Yes. So if I just run the D DDS, D uh, that's. Let's see, I'm trying to look for the function. Maybe what I'll do is look for the function again and then just paste it for you. Um, yeah, just just uh, put it. But uh, but what I show is actually because, because these these function are built in function for DSIC library and it knows the DDS as a DSIC object. Yeah. You don't have to uh, set the slots, for example, like element and uh, it it knows what is DDS. It knows oh. and it knows where to go because results is a built in function in the DSIC two library and it uh. knows. I see. I got it. Actually, I got it now. Thank you so, so much. No problem. No problem. Okay. Uh, another plot that we can use is MA plot visualization. It's very useful and it's a uh, most of the time people uh, show it in courses for a DC uh, probably you, you saw it before as a diamond shape uh, plot that uh, has mean of a normalized count on X axis and Y axis is a lock to uh, full change. And the blue dots are the ones that are significant. So that means if it's the, the, the counts are lower, the fold change should be higher to be significant. But if the counts are higher with lower uh, fold change also, it's gonna get significant. So what we look for, it should be in positive or negative side. It should be either top right uh, or bottom right. So those are the ones that are super significant. Like those genes are like highly significant that we look for. Also, we can uh, uh, have a summary of our res, our results. And with summary, for example, you can see uh, the, the, the total number of uh, uh, read counts, uh, to, to total number of genes. And if the adjusted p-value is uh, 0 0.1, like how many of them, what percentage of them upregulated, what percentage of them down-regulated. It's just a, a, a general overview of uh, your data and your results with summary. Uh, you can get it. Uh, so another step, another thing in DSIC is the shrinkage 
uh, using shrinkage. Uh, shrinkage is actually is a kind of correction factor. We try to improve our data and uh, avoid our avoid the biases and outliers using posterior uh, distribution. So we uh, wanna uh, make sure if the log to fold is is high, it's because of the the stat. It's because of the data, the data, not 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 because of the uh, the 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 the, the low cons and everything. So then we want to reduce our bias and shrink it. So that's the, the similar to same concept, as I mentioned, for dispersion uh, uh, over mean uh, and the, the assumption that we assume the uh, genes with the similar expression level, uh, they have similar uh, dispersion. We try to, uh, with this um, feeding method, and we uh, use this uh, Ape GLM uh, general generalized linear model. Uh, we try to fit better our dispersion and get rid of our biases. So, uh, so we use this uh, like kind of uh, object uh, in uh, R and pass it in uh, so uh, in LFC shrink function which is again a built-in function in DSEQ and we set the type a GLM so we shrink our data and make it uh, so in general what shrinkage does it's a correction factor it avoids uh, outliers and biases so let's apply this and uh, if you if you run this, uh, you can see here there is a paper. You can read this paper if you need to know more about the shrinkage uh, analysis. So this uh, link you can follow it, and that's a good paper uh, for this analysis. Now we plotted again the MA plot based on res LFC based on the shrinkage. And you can see the, the ones that supposed to be outliers noises are gone. No, our data more stringent. So the, 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 the remaining part is, as you see, like most of them are highly significant. So that's the, uh, the advantage of using the shrinkage in the seek function. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for answering. Blues are signif uh, statistically significant, gray is not. So, uh, so the next step is we want to cut off the FDR. We set a uh, cut off for false discovery rate. So depends on you. You If you want to go astringent, you can set 5% or 10%. We set it 5% here because we got a lot of significant ones, as you can see, so we can go further. But sometimes you, in your analysis, you don't see a lot of significance. So you, you want to still have something on your plate. So you go with 10%. As, uh, as you see, sometimes papers like even go to 20% for uh, cutoff for FDR. So uh, we set it 5%. And uh, you can see the res FDR also with the cutoff. Now our results are just kind of applied. The ones, the, the genes that are only uh, the fast discovery rate is uh, less than five percent. Uh, so uh, the next step is a little bit of data process pre-processing, pre and because. Uh, we use ensemble ID, as you see uh, here, we use ensemble ID, but 
uh, we want to uh, get the gene name because nobody remembers what is this ensemble ID is. So it's better and it's cleaner once you plot and you, well, you want to work with genes, like see the genes name. So we get from a uh, HGNC a gene database from human genes database. And there is a library in Bioconductor that we already installed it, annotation DBI and another one uh, org db that we already installed. Using these two libraries, we map uh, ensemble IDs to HGNC gene symbols, just, just mapping the names. And, and if you run again, uh, so that maps. Uh, so the warning you see here, for example, you see many, many mapping is like, is like not, nothing there because uh, in ensemble IDs, some of IDs are not, 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 uh, not, not all of them protein coding genes. Some of them are lung non coding RNA or uh, micro RNA. So, but in uh, HGNC are all protein coding genes. So some of them, uh, just remain empty because of that. So uh, we then we want to reorder uh, the gene that we, we make a gene ID column. The gene ID uh, column now means the gene name, HGNC name, and we want to reorder it and put it first. And now we can uh, have the head and just take a look at it, see, gene ID is now it's the first column and it's a name, is uh, ensemble ID is still the row name. So again, we can have a data frame uh, and uh, take a look at the data frame, gene ID, ensemble ID, and now we have the gene uh, name also here. Uh, now we want to create a, a data frame, a table uh, between gene ID and ensemble, uh, uh, ensemble ID and HGNC gene name. That comes handy later. You will see in plotting because you want to plot something and you want to tell the, the plot, okay, I want to plot this gene, but you know the gene name, but the row names are in uh, ensemble ID to make makes life easier we create a data frame just mapping these two uh, which is called gene list and we can see it gene list c just just mapping gene id hgnc to ensemble id and we just save the results of table into our output file just uh, for uh, future uh, that's that's the result if you want to see the the excel sheet of your data you can go through the results and uh, take a look uh, so we are about to start the visualizing part so i just answered the question uh so we can we can delete the genes that are not uniquely mapped but uh so the most thing we care is like we want to, because for this analysis, we want to plot something and we want to tell the plot, we want to plot this gene and that gene goes to that ensemble ID. So if there are some not map or empty, so we don't care about it because it's, uh, but if you want to make your uh, results cleaner, yeah, that's a good idea. So for visualizing, especially for PCA, principal component analysis, uh, so it's better to first to do a one transformation, which is called variance stabilizing transformation, VST. So uh, VST, uh, so we, from fitted dispersion model, we transfer our data, our DDS object to make it, to have a constant variance along the range of mean values. So that, or it's called the homo -sch 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 -s
if uh, the variance are constant uh, for a similar range of a mean. So uh, we do this transformation and because it's again, it's a differential expression, we do the apply the transformation to all of it. So it doesn't matter. So it's just a transformation of data to make it for visualization uh, better. So we do this and make sure uh, the, there, there, there is a function, there is a built-in function, various stabilizing transformation. And uh, you pass DDS, your DDS object, and there is a blind uh, uh, setting that make sure to pass it false. Uh, so that blind uh, actually, uh, if you pass it through, it's gonna recalculate again the, your, uh, your dispersion function and uh, actually blind true means doesn't care about it's uh, the, the different condition are biologically different so but in our case two different biologically different we want to take into account because sometimes we don't care about like we 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 we, we want to uh, the transformation to be blind over the whole condition but no we don't want to be blind we want because uh, for example the variance might be higher in drug treated or in control. So we wanna make sure it, it, to keep it false uh, for our analysis. And we run this and, uh, and we can view uh, that v VST. Uh, as you can see here, it's uh, no, uh, it's kind of transformed uh, in a way uh, the numbers are different from uh, the, the, the level that you get like for read counts before no it's like in a way that uh, uh, close to each other and we handle the variance uh, if we want to go to draw the pca so uh, make sure to pass vst variable here and uh, here we just for, for condition and replicates, uh, we just uh, make an int group in our PCA data. And the percent variable is just, we, we round the percent variability and just uh, multiply it by 100, it's just, just to make it, make it a percentage. And then we prepare the PCA uh, variable, then we add it, we pass it through uh, the uh, the ggplot uh, uh, function for for PCA, and uh, we will see uh, how the PCA looks like. Uh, so, uh, as I mentioned, this is uh, real world data. This is not some makeup data that, like, sometimes people show they are uh, cleanly uh, clustered together this is real world data and and as you can see it's pretty nice for real world data because we have uh, lab contamination and other issue for sure for samples like you do experiments and uh, everything is not always clean and uh, nice but this is the real world data, but still you can see the clusters uh, for DMSO and one cluster for uh, SP treated uh, in the data, in the, in the PCA plotting. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point, Zach. That's a good point. And uh, yeah, you can save it to PDF just with this instru instruction. You can save it to PDF. We already did it. It's in. It's on the GitHub, uh, but you can do it for yourself or your repository or your local machine. Uh, so you can have the, if you have data and you want to show it as a PDF uh, or present it anywhere, you can just uh, make it PDF. So, uh, the next step is just we want to uh, do some clustering. So for clustering, so we 
have this VST variable, we pass it through the say, and then transpose it. And using this function, we create the sample list and uh, now with some preparation, we make it matrix and just some settings for our clustering. So uh, now we can have our clustering plots. And here, for example, uh, we, we use the, the distance uh, uh, function as a Pearson. You can use uh, uh, anything, Euclidean, Manhattan, Cumbra, or uh, any other type of function, Spearman. Uh, so, but we use uh, Pearson. Anything looks better for your data, just, just come here and change it. And here's the clustering. So we can see this is patient number four and five, the drug treated of four and five, and DMSO of four and five are kind of clustered together, like two patients clustered together, and three patients, one, two, three, like you see the DMSO and drug treated also kind of clustered together, uh, which is kind of nice. Uh, because uh, they are same patient, same person. It's drug treated. It's the, the condition is different, but it's still the same person. So, uh, uh, or other uh, information that you, if you go further, go over the plot further, you can get and capture uh, other interesting facts. And uh, again, you can, uh, save it as a PDF. Um, so now we can, uh, using the complex heat map library that we load, uh, let me first see the question. Yeah, the, the heat map is actually, we do some uh, hierarchical clustering. So we see, for example, these two first cluster to each other and uh, cluster to each other, then cluster together is like a hierarchical clustering. You can see the, the lines here. And also in rows, uh, uh, you can see these two like replicate four and five of a drug and then they cluster with, with the same person, but uh, untreated. And uh, you can just, uh, just cut off anywhere you want and just say, okay, these are cluster together that's that's the good thing about hierarchical clustering so uh, it depends on your application and what what you see um useful here um, but uh, sometimes it's just just to see if if you did your experiment correctly if the data makes sense if your cluster uh, for drug and uh, for example untreated sometimes sometimes you you don't see any difference and uh then then you see okay so there there there, there might be no effect uh so it will be better in this uh, complex heat map so first uh, we just uh, get the top 30 gene that are differentially expressed and uh, order them just kind of rank them and uh, having first created data, see these, uh, these are the top 30 genes. And then again, we map it through the HGNC because th these are from ensemble, ensemble ID. And uh, now if we get the heat map data, you can see uh, we have gene ID also here. So the NA1 here is probably this one is not protein coding. Uh, so, uh, and then we kind of do some cleaning, just just uh, uh, omit some uh, columns that we don't want. And uh, we set the row names as gene ID. Now we just get the, variable of heat map data. 
it's from subset of the, the heat map data that from gene ID, the top 31, we subset from top 31. And uh, so the other thing is, uh, in order to look nice, we're gonna scale it from center. So uh, using this, uh, we apply this uh, scale function. So uh, we scale our data uh, to avoid outliers and to, to center our data. So for example, like we have heat map data, uh, we can take a look at heat map data and heat map two uh, is once it's scaled. So we can take a look at both of them. Heat map data and heat map two. See heat, heat map data is like here is like 10, 11, something like that. But if you see the same, Row, it makes it center like from one to minus one makes it makes makes the data center it's still differential expression but uh, to avoid outliers and to make your uh, heat map look better so uh, we do this and here just be setting the the colors and everything for your heat map and uh, again, we use Spearman Centroid here for our clustering. You can change this if you find it, it looks better. So just feel free to change it. If, if you wanna change it, for example, the clustering method from uh, the, 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 the distance method from uh, Spearman to, uh, to Manhattan, Euclidean or Pearson or anything you like. And uh, here is the the most the the better version of uh, uh, our heat map. So um, you can see here. If uh, I guess you need to zoom more because we have thirty. Maybe 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 with twenty it looks better. Uh, you can try for yourself. So this uh, left part of uh, your uh, map is your control DMSO and right part is your drug treated. You can see, for example, which genes are upregulated or which genes are downregulated. And these are the most significant, the top 31, the, the most significant one. Then, then you go through the, the genes name and looking for the most interesting one, uh, uh, for example, the CDKN1 uh, is like, it's, uh, I guess it's assumed to be related to prostate cancer or VEGF, uh, which is uh, causing angiogenesis to, uh, to, to accelerate uh, blood flow to, to, to tumor. So then you can, you can look for any genes that, that based on literature uh, that uh, comes interesting and you want to do further analysis on that. Yeah, thank you for answering. Yeah, they're both using to stop. The PDF. So uh, again, we can save it as a PDF. Another useful plot is a volcano plot. We we plot it for all genes here, but but we want to specify some cutoffs. So for example, the p value uh, five percent point, point uh, zero five. Uh, and also the 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 log fold change uh, if it's minus uh, plus minus one, and also p value co or or combination of these two together. We use this uh, function enhanced volcano uh, from one of the library that we load. Uh, so here, for example, you can see. Uh, 
your volcano plot. So uh, the red ones are both p-value is less than uh, 5%, 0 0.5, and log to uh, fault change is above uh, or lower than, above, the, uh, above uh, plus one or lower than minus one. Or we can have p-value only or log to fault change only and the gray ones are not significant. So basically these are the, the right uh, side of a uh, plot, the one that are upregulated, the, the, the left part, the one that are downregulated. And we are looking for something to be uh, right and top or left and top. For example, this one now looks uh, very significant. Uh, in our analysis, but we need to go further through this gene and look into literature, see if it makes sense or not. Just uh, the, the CDKM1 that I mentioned, for example, is here. So it, it needs the knowledge of your study that what you're doing and uh, the genes that you are looking for, the gene that you are interested so you can uh, get some candidates, some nice candidates to work further. And uh, yeah, that's, that's for volcano plot. And uh, you can save again in PDF. Uh, so the last plots that we wanna do, we wanna for some genes, like some genes that we think that are interesting, like CDKN1A, or VEGF or uh, BRCA1 that are important in all type of cancers. So uh, you can select either of them, just to start with any of them here, that's how it goes. Like you don't have to run all of them, just pick one and just, this is the gene that you wanna plot. Then uh, remember that we made a data frame called gene list that I said, it comes handy later that maps, um, it's here, uh, maps gene ID, gene uh, name to ensemble ID. So uh, we use that one and uh, just create another variable called gene count and that uh, gene count using uh, gene ID. So uh, now, uh, for example, we can plot different things as a like uh, some, dot plots. Uh, so for example, this is, we passed in aesthetic in ggplot, the, the condition and count. So the, the X axis is, is the condition, DMSO and SP for different replicates. And uh, this is the normalized read count. For example, you see for these genes, CDK and y, uh, 1A, uh, it's uh, for different replicates, you can see uh, how it's uh, expressed and uh, you can see that that's, that's the similar thing that we saw before. Uh, now we can uh, play around with different columns that I mentioned that we have in sample data. For example, this uh, mutational burden, uh, TMB1, and that you can uh, just uh, use the another uh, jitter as a, as a color and size for that. Uh, so for example, here you can see you have DMSO, you have your drug and normalized read count, but it's color coded. So if it's darker, the, the mutation burden is lower for the, for the, for the, the, the brighter blue one, uh, those are, uh, mutation burden is higher. And as you can see here, it's expressed more, but there is no correlation in mutation burden, which makes sense because for example, this dot and this dot are the same per person, still the same person. So drug doesn't do anything uh, with the mutation of burden, I guess it's, uh, uh, it doesn't do anything in transcription level uh, 
So, uh, and you can see this and these are the same, and these three and these three are the same persons. So, um, uh, you can you can play around with different, con for example, PSA and different things, and uh, just see. Uh, for example, for PSA, also the same, like you see, it's like it's it's highly expressed, but once once it's there, but but the the PSA uh, is higher. For example, for this one, is it is the same person, and it's the same person for this. So there is no correlation you can find, but you can go for different condition. If you had different stage, for example, no, you can use different stages and using color coded different stage and plot any of them and see, okay, for any of them, you can go manually one by one and check, okay, which one and uh, looks more interesting. And uh, you, you can uh, analyze it further. So, uh, so then, yeah, then uh, you can save it to PDF, these three, and go again, select another gene, VEGF, for example, and then repeat the same process uh, for any gene that you select uh, for different plots that you get. For VEGF, for example, it's, it's highly expressed. Again, but here, but the same pattern. So this is the same person. This is the same person. These. So you can uh, basically go go through uh, different columns that you have in your sample info ba based on your data, and uh, try to see if there is a correlation uh, between the control and your wild type. So uh, you can you can use uh, the star as I mentioned, but there is a, a subread map. Uh, there is a there is a library also in R, if I remember correctly. R R subread R subread, I guess. Uh, then uh, you can just pass your uh, uh, the annotation of different genes and uh, your BAM files and uh, just pass through your BAM files and annotation and it gives you the count matrix as an output. I guess R subread uh, package is in R. You can do it. Uh, yes. Okay, so that's it for today. If you have any question, I'm happy to answer. And I'm gonna put the slides, I'm gonna make sure you reach the slides. Uh, so yeah, we we wanted to uh, to put that pathway analysis uh, based on Go, uh, but uh, so first uh, it was the time limitation and uh, the installation of some package for path pathway analysis is like uh, you need to install iGraph. And I found it, it's, uh, it's difficult to install. The installation sometimes is not good for uh, Mac. So we decided to leave it out, the pathway analysis for this uh, section. Um, but uh, we are happy to share the code with you if you wanna uh, work on that because we, we already have the, the, the codes for that. No, it's not in the bits we, we removed because it, it would have been confusing, but I, I can just uh, uh, add another file uh, like 
this one is called analysis. I can just add an analysis with pathway and uh, add those and just uh, uh, push it again. Uh, Yeah, we, we, I, I try to do that. I just, we, we had, we, we have the code is, but if you're using Mac, it's uh, the, sometimes the installations are uh, for, because pathway analysis, you need to have a graph like from different genes. So uh, sometimes it's, it's especially the, the M1 chip. Uh, if, if you're, if you're using Intel chip, uh, it might be easier. So for the for the alignment, if you go to our GitHub repository at the end, there is a link. Piero, uh, in his GitHub, uh, he has the star the complete tutorial. If you go, uh, uh, additional notes. There is a link here at the end. So. So yeah, advanced uh, RNA sequencing analysis is like, I guess um, now it's time to uh, nine for, time for transition from bulk RNA sequencing to single cell RNA sequencing. If you learn uh, single cell RNA sequencing, that would be great. That's, that's, that's a very hot topic. Uh, yeah, and, and it's a SORAT. Yeah, that's true, SORAT in R. Uh, uh, that you can use. It's it's pretty hard right now. It's like it's a trend. People people try to transition from bulk RNA sequencing to single cell RNA. In, in in future, you you're gonna hear more about single cell RNA sequencing. Yeah. Okay, if there is no more questions, so uh, yeah. thank you for your attention, everybody. Yeah, if there is no more questions, so we can just end the session and uh, I hope you learn from this session. <laughs>